And we are live. We are live. Thank you for joining us here on the GMI Hub online. And today we are going to be talking about engaging young people, youth especially. And, and our special guests on tonight's show, we have Michelle McLaren. I'm saying that right, McLaren. And we have Jason Prasad. And we are so glad to have them both with us tonight. And uh, I'm just introducing myself first. My name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Newick. And we do want to welcome Melissa and Jason. Melissa and Jason are both pastors of different churches. Melissa is a, a worship pastor, but why we invite her is she has such a passion for um, reaching children and youth. And and not and you know last week we were talking with Judy um, Vandevich. Is that how I say her name, Dale? Yeah, Vandevich. Yeah, Vandevich. Yes. Yeah. Um, we were speaking to Judy about engaging children with music and how to write song music. But now we're going to take the next age group up. We're going to talk about how do we engage our youth, and and not just engaging our youth by by song, but engaging them to participate in song and actually be part of a ministry. So, and that's the passion of both Melissa and Jason. Um, Jason is an associate pastor at a church in Brampton, the Bramley Christian Fellowship. Is that correct? That's correct. I always want to say Brampton <laughs> <laughs> Christian Fellowship. Um, and uh, Jason's background has been, he was a youth director with Youth for Christ, correct? Correct. I got it right. Um, and even as an associate pastor, very much involved with the youth and young adults of this church. So Jason, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank and you. Melissa, I didn't say the name of your church because I get it mixed up. <laughs> Bethel Pentecostal. Bethel Pentecostal out in Stratford. Yep. Correct. And I know Melissa because I used to sing with Melissa too on a worship team and I know her heart. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so um, I know normally Dale would like to jump in and have a conversation, but um, I want to ask you both. We were, talking, we were talking about engaging our youth and engaging our youth through music. So one of the things I wanted to ask, first of all, with regards to dealing with youth, what are some of the factors that you've had to take into account when even thinking about working with youth and kids <laughs> and i guess i gotta pick one <laughs> any mini mini mo <laughs> melissa why don't you go first <laughs> i think kids um especially the, the age group that i've worked with in particular with with worship um is grades four to seven and we do like jam nights and we're teaching them you know how how to engage in worship on their instrument um they're so impressionable and they're so woundable um it's really really easy for them to give up and just to go i'm not good enough um they're just very um um what you have to watch um, what you say and be really, really encouraging. I think, you know, we're talking about youth. So um, we've got lots of youth on our worship band. And so I think with some of the older ones, you can draw that expectation up and you can pull that expectation and um, you can use some harder constructive criticism, but the younger they are, you really, really need to be gentle and to be genuine because I think they can see right through you if you're not. Um, and so that's one of the first things that I would say is just, be very, very uh, gentle. And then the, the other thing I would say too, is I think they need a quick win. I think as adults and the older we get, we realize that um, um, if you work really hard at something for a really, 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 really long time, you'll get there. But kids are like, if I don't see some improvement right away, I'm so out, why am I doing this? And so I think with kids um, or with youth or junior high, if you can give them um, a win every time um, and quickly, then they'll be in it a little bit longer. Yeah, it's just like, um, um, I, I can totally relate to what you're saying because dealing, I've, I personally have dealt with uh, children and um, especially in a music situation in a youth choir. And I remember thinking about how they had to feel, be encouraged every time they, they sang a note and or they did something and quickly celebrate with them. So that's, that's so true. I can totally relate with that. 
Jason, how about you? You've dealt with youth but more on the um, older age group. What are some things that you take into consideration when trying to get them involved in ministry? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that Melissa would bring up that age group. We had a funny conversation in our house last night. Uh, my son is 10 years old, and my wife said to him last night that she needs him to do a solo for our Christmas thing we're trying to put together. And it ensued like, no, I'm not doing that. But two years ago, it was like, sure, no problem. And uh, so it's amazing how, you know, there's the adjustment. Um, you know, what are the things with um, young people? And let me talk a little bit about junior highs, uh, maybe grade six, seven, and eight. Uh, we, we do start to develop our students and our young people in our church around grade four and five. But especially in that age group, um, they're so self-conscious about, um, you know, if they're doing well or not, because it's about image. And the unfortunate thing about social media today, our young people are on social media. So they see this, uh, this, this image of having to be perfect, not just an outward look, but even in what they do. And uh, so I agree with Melissa that we've got to be able to celebrate the, you know, the wins with them and help them to see the wins to help build their confidence uh, so that they'll be engaged and be involved and see that they add value. Uh, you know, the students, we have part of our music teams. We don't say you're part of the, just the junior team. You know, you're, you're part of the music ministry of this church. And even though this is, you know, the youth team, you're, you're part of the larger team. And uh, integrating them is key. We even have our youth team on Sundays, uh, which is our high school team. Uh, playing on Sundays and involved, but that took development from the younger ages and building those wins and celebrating with them younger. Do now, now one thing I, I'm hearing from both of you is that um, your churches or your ministries basically see ministry starting from very young with the with with I'll say kids and youth. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? And that's so awesome because some there are some churches that may not feel like their their kids are ready for that what would you say to those churches that that feel that maybe you know their kids have to they're they're at a uh, at a stage in life where they're supposed to be um they're supposed to be taught and learned until they reach a certain age before they're involved in ministry how would you would you encourage them i think i would say first of all there's no junior holy spirit and I mean, the Bible talks so much about us coming to the Father with a childlike faith. I feel like we're backpedaling once the older we get. We're trying to reverse people going, hey, remember how when you used to just think everything was awesome? And all of a sudden you put these adult, you know, like, like muddy glasses on as you become adults with the wounds that we, we bring into life. Um, and there's just such a childlike faith that they have. Um, and... Um, the, the creativity is just huge. I think that the, um, for, I, I would like, I almost want to say a couple things. Um, I have caught myself over the years praying musicians in, right? You're like, oh Lord, we need a drummer, please. For, you know, unfortunately the other church is going to lose one, but you're yeah. going to make a drummer into my church, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. And then it just hit me. I'm like, you know what? If worship really was so important to us. Um, we really need to have a culture of worship in our church where it's raised up from the bottom up and they're not looking at one day, you know, they get to be on it. Um, but the other thing is too, um, I think um, with the cost of, of music lessons and um, with the push of video games, as we've kind of talked in the pre stuff, um, but then sports, music has really lost um, a lot of, they're just like, like we were saying with the, the win, it's really hard work for nothing, you know, like half hour, hour practices every day. Why would I do that when I could, you know, sit on a video game? And so um, I feel like as a church, um, if you can almost like dangle that carrot in front of their head and say, hey, this is accessible to you now, then they'll actually get on the instrument. They'll actually put, you know, parents don't want to spend money on lessons that the kids are not going to do. They're not going to spend money on lessons that the kids aren't going to practice into or have a value for. And so if you can give the kids that, that 
you know, carrot dangling in front of their head, then they'll realize that, that they can achieve this now. Um, I think for churches, um, if you want to have excellence in your adult worship ministry, I think you need to train that up in the younger ministries. I well think said. Yeah, you know, well by the said. time a, um, a, a young adult is 18, 20 years old, their, um, their level of excellence or ability to practice um, or to even know how to practice properly um, is already formed. And you can practice 10 hours a day, but if you're practicing wrong, you're not getting anywhere. And so I think that if we could teach our kids how to practice properly, how to have the right heart first, then we are raising them up in the culture of worship. And um, um, I think we're going to see a 10-year plan for our adult worship, you know, but to not devalue that our kids need live worship. You know, our, I believe that our kids need to see kids leading worship because they're the ones going through the, the things that the other kids are going through. And so they can speak into those areas and prophesy into them, you know, and Absolutely. pray for them. And that's, yeah. that's what we want. That's really cool. I, and I, I appreciate the fact you talk about those wins, the, the short-term wins uh, where you want to encourage them as soon as possible to, uh, and, and it makes them feel valued and they matter and they're part of the team. Um, we're taking all these different factors into account for a person, like, you know, ind individually what the person may be like. Maybe there's, like, I, I work with special needs kids too. So I, I know that there's certain um, psychology to working with people, but when it, taking all those factors into account, right, when working with youth, isn't it, is it, is it important for a youth leader or a worship band leader to know what's current in the, the youth culture? Um, the current affairs, maybe the, you know, the now thing. You know, I definitely think so. Um, you know, I was thinking just as Melissa was speaking about um, churches have to evaluate uh, the risk versus reward. We know that's a term they use with investing. And when mm -hmm. I look at uh, the young people that are in our church, um, we really have to invest today because it's not about investing today just for tomorrow. It's about investing in the now. And, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is depending on the demographic and style of church and philosophy of the church, uh, some churches have really, um, I don't know what the right word is, but they've, um, but they've sort of disabled their future because they have focused on, uh, on the older people within the church. And please don't misunderstand me. It's the older people who pay the bills and I, and I get it. I've been in ministry long enough to know that students and young adults early in age are the ones that really support the church financially but when we look at churches that need to be able to develop that you know at a young age it's um it's it's absolutely critical i think when you look at the risk and reward even the style of music um you know let me give you an example when i came into brampton uh, on staff seven years ago at the church that i'm in um our young people primarily listen to black gospel music and that was it and our church was becoming more multicultural and um, one of the first uh, small group meetings that I did, I actually uh, took a laptop and I was playing a song called Set a Fire. I'm sure some of you have heard it. That was Will Regan. And they had never listened to, and I'm going to say it, just to be transparent and honest here, white music before. It just wasn't in their genre or anything. And I think it's important for us to help them, our, our young people get beyond just style so they understand the importance and the, and the theology of words. And I literally turn the computer around so they wouldn't see the group so that they would worship. And over a period of time, we were able to change the culture of our youth ministry specifically. So it became a more multicultural and more diverse in style of music where, where we were doing Caribbean songs uh, from before. We now were able to integrate, um, you know, as I mentioned, like Hillsong or Bethel. And now our students don't see uh, just one style of music and preference, but helping them understand that worship is, is, isn't just about the style you like. It is about what glorifies God and what gives people an opportunity to connect and worship God and give him everything mm. that he deserves out of our being. So that's sort of what we've done over the last seven years, but it's taken us time to actually get there so that we could address style and all those things. And that's been something that's overflowed in our, in our congregation as well as we've 
uh, you know, e evolved as a church in the area of music. But that's been intentional. And along the way, you do lose some people. But at the same time, we're looking at the risk versus reward for the long term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bravo. I, I'll, I'll have to say bravo to that. And I know this is kind of, I would say it's not related, but there's one thing that we have been talking about in previous um, episodes is about, it, it's literally about bringing that, that unity. And, and there are some churches, like you pointed out, Jason, that they, they listen to maybe one style and say, that's the God style and everything else is not, right? And then, but, but yes, it does take time to integrate because really what it all, it's all about is the message of, of Christ and the message of worshiping God and everyone pointing to God and regardless of the style. So bravo um, for your church on that. And thank you for that example. I'm, I'm now thinking about something that has popped up and, and I actually have something from our audience about this. Um, thinking about schools, youth, um, I know pre-COVID, um, there are some school districts that actually, and I, I don't want to say enforce, but highly encourage or make it part of their, the, 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 the district's programming that the kids have to learn an instrument. They have to do it as part of their school curriculum. And my question for, for both of you, because I think you're all in both in different districts, is A, is that true for your district and B, has your church kind of incorporated or worked with schools in order to, um, I guess, work with those schools and, and encouraging the kids with their instruments and applying that to, I guess, learning worship, learning how to play? I have not even really thought about it. You're totally inspiring me. I'm like, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. I have not even thought about that, especially with COVID and, you know, you can't have, you know, they're not really doing much music. So I, we haven't, that's a great idea. How about you, Jason? You know something, it's, it's been a work in progress for us. It wasn't on our radar really till about two years ago. We have a number of students that attend uh, a really artsy school down the street from our church. Um, the, the, uh, so our students are involved with dance and music, and, but the challenge has been the, the connection with the school administration. Um, it's, it's been hard to get in and build a partnership. Like, I mean, we've offered money. I had, you know, just to give you an example, I had $2,000 in uh, gift cards to give to the school to help kids in need. Um, and they didn't return calls or even emails. Said we, you know, and so from that level, you know, it's, it's been a little bit challenging. It's been our desire to work with the schools close to us, but it really depends on the receptivity of the administration to do that. Um, but um, so that's been our challenge, but it wasn't on our radar for a very, very long time. And it's still a work that we desire that we hope that we could work with. So that, that's, that's fascinating. Some of the challenges I think that you, you might meet would be internal, but yours is the trying to reach out to the external. That's, that's what other challenges or blessings ha has there been in, in, in the past? Can I just share a quick uh, win story for us? It's, it's small, but it's significant. Uh, you know, I'm so proud, like, especially of our high school students that uh, our, our creative arts director in our church and our music director have worked with over the last couple of years. And, um, uh, last year, our high school team uh, was in the process of uh, leading um, praise and worship for our junior high retreat, which is our grade six, seven, and eight. And so it was sort of a mixed training last year. And this year, they fully let it out. It was a week before they locked down everything in March, and we were thankful to get that junior high retreat in. But I tell you, it, it was amazing to see the fruit of a lot of hours of investment and time and, uh, you know... Um, Sometimes you have to suffer on the excellent side of things when you're working with the younger, but it's not about the excellent side of things. It's about the heart and the spirit behind it. And, you know, uh, and, you know, and the desire and passion that's there to be able to serve. And, you know, there was never a, a time where we went and said, you know, that really stunk today, you know, and to be honest with you, there were some days it was just like, okay, we're going through some uh, violin training here and it, it isn't sounding great, but as you continue to speak life and believe in them, and I love what Melissa said earlier, 
just celebrate the win and build the confidence in them. I tell you, it is amazing to see the growth as you just, you know, share with them what you believe the win is and celebrate what God's doing in them, how quickly they will actually grow and just, um, yeah, with that. So that's just a story that's been a success for, for us. You know, the challenge now, and I think Melissa highlighted this earlier, and I, or Cheryl, is that with uh, sports on the radar and uh, video games, we are seeing less students involved in music. And we see a potential blockage in our pipeline that we've developed over the last five or six years. And we're trying to rack our brains how to actually address that. And um, for example, one of the parents posted their daughter singing on Facebook the other day at a family birthday party. And I messaged the mom and said, she's only in grade six. And, and I said, I need her on the youth worship team. <laughs> and her mom messaged me back and said, sure, let's talk. And I'm like, we've got to figure it out because uh, that pipeline, I didn't know she had the talent, but you know something? Uh, God's placed it in her. So now we just want to be able to cultivate that in the area of worship to use the gift that God's placed. But uh, so those are some blessings and some challenges that we foresee in our specific uh, church. Wow, that's, that's amazing. I love that. So any youth that are watching right now, just sing on YouTube or sing on Facebook. You'll be discovered and your church <laughs> will get you on their youth worship team, okay? <laughs> and, <laughs> You. <laughs> Justin Bieber, come on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there we go. That's how he got famous. <laughs> hey, if you're watching with us, we're, you're just joining in on a conversation I'm ha we're having here with Melissa McLaren and Jason Prasad, both pastors that have been working with children and youth and getting them involved in music ministry. Hey, if you are listening, you know, if you're joining us, feel free to to share this experience, grab your tea, coffee, water, whatever, and just sit around the table with us and have this conversation. It's very encouraging. We're talking about some wins here of how we can actually engage our youth in ministry. Um, Melissa, you have a, a program that I want to hear about. Um, you talked about jam nights and, and something else that you've mentioned. And I'm really curious, how exactly is your program working to engage youth into to literally being ministers of worship? Well, we, um, I was talking with our, our youth pastor and just talking about this whole concept of how do we raise kids up um, from the ground up and have a culture of worship. And, and he kind of off cuff said, you know what, we used to do something in our church and it was called jam nights. And I'm like, I'm taking it. I'm stealing it. There's nothing new under the sun, right? And I'm like, I love it. And I have wanted for a long time to do something like this to have lessons available for free or something but there just never seemed to be um enough musicians available enough teachers that's kind of where we went you know it was a, a wall there um and all of a sudden the passion started growing and growing and growing and all of a sudden it was just like god said green light go and all of you know, out of the woodworks, all these, you know, teachers and, and people who got, got inv involved that I never thought, you know, would. Um, and so basically we meet on Thursday nights. Um, the prerequisite is at this point that they are taking lessons outside the church because the idea for us is um, I think, you know, people will take Royal Conservatory or whatever, and everybody's going to be at a different level. Um, so they need to learn the, mo the basic skills at home and be practicing. But then we can come and take um, their skill level and learn, um, teach them how to um, transfer that into worship music, which can be very different, right? Um, and how to work as a band, how to play together, how to use their ears more than their hands or either ears more than their voice. Um, and so we talk about different, a different concept each time. We really dig into worship um, uh, songwriting um, because what we, the, what, what we do is it's grades four to grade seven. They sign up, um, they have to make sure that they're taking lessons. But when they come that day, we actually hand them a journal and we do devotions first. And um, we do a devotion and then we get them to kind of go find a place in the church by themselves. And um, they need to take that scripture verse or whatever we focused on 
and say, God, what do you want to speak to me? And then they need to journal that. And they're a little bit shocked by how much time we spend on that compared to, you know, music. But they need to realize that what comes first is their relationship with Jesus. And being able to open those spiritual ears to hear Jesus speaking to them is what worship is. You know, it's a conversation. It's not just music notes. Um, and so we start there. Um, and then, you know, we actually start pretty basic because we're dealing with grade fours. So we're learning, here's a chord for some of them. They know what the notes are, but here's the chords. And we start with two chords going back and forth. Let's take your favorite scripture and let's write a song. And that's kind of our win because each week, you know, we can, you know, write a silly song about dogs or we could take the scripture, but we've written a song. They've actually been able to play it. Um, and then we take an easy, easy song like Great Are You, Lord. It's got like three chords. Um, and then we break them off into separate groups. And so when we were um, meeting in the sanctuary, we'd have different, you know, rooms around the church and we'd have a different teacher per instrument. And then they would, you know, go off on their own for about 20 minutes and learn the chords just for that song. So really at the beginning, you were focusing on three chords and how to play them together. And we focused on the metronome and how, you know, almost anxiety can be formed when something increases, increases, increases in speed and tempo um, and why that's important. Um, and then we'd come back together at the end and we'd have a couple keyboards set up and their instruments and we'd swap people and learn how to play together. And then, you know what, this might be another topic about when COVID hit. So um, for now, that's about where we have, um, what we do. And as they progress, um, to be honest with you, it's new enough that we haven't been able to play well. And then COVID hit. Um, that we haven't got to the level fully yet where we've, you know, been that band for the kids uh, ministry, but that, that has been our goal. So now, in that scenario, Melissa, is there um, the older youth that's maybe mentoring the younger youth? Are the ones who are maybe more um, proficient on their musical instruments helping to lead those groups? Yes. So this is, um, this is your first step group. So grades four to seven. And so um, once you've passed through this and we've handed you off to Pastor Carlo, the youth pastor, um, and they've gotten a bit more experience, they are our teachers, a lot of them. So the worship mm -hmm. leaders for the youth are actually, you know, the ones teaching the youth, uh, the drums and the guitars. And then there's the wonderful mentoring that happens, you know, especially because you know, that tr transition between junior high and youth, what junior high wants to walk into a, a room full of te scary teenagers, right? Scary. And so they get to walk into a room of somebody who knows them really well. And I love that. So I think that's amazing because you're taking um, mentorship, making it practical. And those people who are mentoring are leaders and you're teaching them leadership at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's just great. I love it. And how to break down their skill. Um, like if you are two steps ahead of a kid, you can teach. You don't have mm. to be a professional teacher. Sure. You don't have to be, you know, have a, you know, what is a rival anybody? Nobody arrives at anything. But you just have to be like one step ahead. But to be able to teach them how to break it down and keep it really simple to communicate that is really important. So I think that's a really effective uh, influence on the younger uh, kids as they're coming up in the ranks. Absolutely. So an example of that. So if a youth has grade four piano, just using piano, just because that came to my mind, and uh, say a grade four child has grade one piano, like just knows the theory, so that grade four student can teach the grade one student in piano is that how that works absolutely yeah ah. because the level that we're starting at is so simple mm -hmm. and they need to know and it's kind of like the whole idea of church in discipleship mm -hmm. you just have to be one step ahead and we should always be taking somebody else through right yeah and so to to break it down and make it less complicated is a i think very essential and you also mentioned about the band scenario. That's a whole different ball game for a musician, especially the first time, because you're listening and you're playing and you're being a part of a group. And so there's the, 
that learning opportunity and the whole process of that, which goes into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the icing on the cake for the kids where they get to come at the end and, and to play together, but it definitely teaches them. Um, you know what, that's what teaches them the value of, um, of the metronome as well, because, you know, it takes away the fight between were you speeding up or was I speeding up? No, (laughs) It was you. You right? always blame the drummer, right? You always blame the drummer. Always, always. And so we've got this metronome and they're trying to get that, you know, to have that, that uh, central, central beat going on. Um, but then to honor each other yeah. and to honor um, and, and to be able to be vulnerable in that situation. We actually have a rule that we say from the very get go and we, we, re-emphasize it every single lesson and we the number one rule is you have to make a mistake because if you don't make a mistake you're not growing and you're not that's trying anything new perfect that's perfect love it what happens is when they do make a mistake they actually get a pat on the back instead of the shame or the embarrassment and so it keeps the um environment of growing um alive so that they don't you know, just want to disappear under the pew. We don't have pews, but you know, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. it's so important to have an honoring atmosphere there. That is so awesome. I just had this vision of of almost having like a songwriter circle. You know, all these all these youth and kids all around in a circle. They're playing these two chords and singing uh, the memory verse. And now, and I was just going to ask you, and you answered it already. I was going to say, so do you get a chance to sing it in public? Or do you sing it amongst to each other? But you said no. So. <laughs> Not yet. We were so close. We were this close. <laughs> Shut it down. We got to record something over online. I got to get just a little bit more techie. You are talking to one of the most untechy people. And the, actually, to be honest with you, I have the questions for you that might be after of how are we all talking together on, on Zoom? I feel like you know, the problems that we came into over COVID was, you know, oh, who's, uh, who, uh, who's talking, who is playing? And so I need to figure out how you're doing this right now. <laughs> okay, that'll be a, a Zoom conversation, conversation after we're done. <laughs> Jason, um, tell us how, how is, um, if you can, how the music and youth, how is that working in your church? Um, you know something, we're, we're really blessed. Like I, like I really can't take any credit for some of the things that have happened. We have a fantastic a creative arts director at our church uh, who oversees the music. Um, and then um, we have a band director as well. And they've done a tremendous job over the last few years. And um, I think it was maybe three years ago, it could have been four years ago, they introduced something called what we call Amplified Worship Arts Camp. And we do a worship arts camp uh, over March break uh, normally and in the summertime. It's a week in the summer and I think it's one, maybe two days in, um, in March. And uh, so there's been some key things that we have developed uh, as a team. And let me say this, I work very closely with them. We, we've worked very closely as ministries in the church, uh, our children's, our junior high, our youth, and our music department very closely over the last number of years to not work in silos, but to look at the best interest of our young people for their development, but also for the church as well. So, uh, so we've worked very close. So if, uh, you know, our music director who oversees worship and, uh, you know, worship for the church is in need of something, we're right on board to help and support whatever we need to do uh, arts camps and different types of things because we recognize that working together uh, is only for the benefit of all. And uh, so uh, those are key moments, but then they're, they're very committed even with uh, our young people now. They're actually both music teachers in a school part-time. Uh, in a, and so uh, they are very committed to work with our young people uh, individually and even as a group. And so uh, for us, creating that culture uh has has taken us time but man i i tell you once you get the ball rolling and the and the momentum going and you know one thing that i like to even mention what melissa was talking about is sell you know is you need to make a mistake i think one of the things that we've done in the church wrong is we don't it is 
is, is we've celebrated perfection and we haven't celebrated the journey of learning and growing. And let me give you an example. You know, for example, uh, you know, all of us, well, I've grown up in church since I was nine years old and in my forties now. And, you know, the people who made the testimony time on Sundays were the people that had the really, really good testimonies. And uh, a few years ago, about three or four years ago, I, I realized that our youth ministry wasn't growing. And, you know, you could preach evangelism and you could push them to witness to their friends. And then, it, you know, and then I had this moment with God and can't tell you when and how it happened, but I just thought, you know, we need to celebrate failure. And let me explain this. And uh, so in order to encourage our students sharing, now this is evangelism, this is not music, but it's about creating a culture where students feel comfortable to grow through their mistakes, is I started this segment in our, in our youth ministry about three and a half years ago called Take Five. We called it Take Five. We took five minutes to share the good, bad, and ugly of our faith. And it was about sharing stories of witnessing to your friends and failing. Because our students had only seen the people with the good testimonies get up on a Sunday or at youth group, whatever. So the first year, I couldn't get a student to share. I was absolutely discouraged and like I'm a horrible pastor. Like I can't even get a student to share. There, is there any student sharing their faith with their friends? And then all of a sudden, one student got up one week, like after like a year. And that's no joke. It was like a year. I wanted to quit after six months doing this segment, but just felt to persevere. And this one student got up and said, you know... I've invited one of my friends to youth like five times and they bail on me every single time the night of. And do you know something? I'm just like, man, I'm just like deflated and everyone clapped. And it was just like, what? So we had a chance to pray for that student that God would encourage them. And all of a sudden, this store, kid started sharing every week. You know, I got up in my biology class and I shared about Jesus and my teacher and people mocked me and we'd clap and we'd celebrate not necessarily the failure, but the effort. And after about two and a half years, and, you know, and this is the interesting thing we had seen in our youth ministry, it, it just went flat. And part of it, it was just, just flat. Uh, and, but all of a sudden this past January, and this is no joke, beginning of January hits. And with our take five segment, we had so many students sharing their faith in their schools. I had to shut down the segment because it was taking up youth service and I had to stop it. We had to do worship. We had to preach and we had different things that we needed to do. And this is no joke. All of a sudden this past January before COVID, our youth ministry grew 30%. I had about 20 new kids show up in a matter of two or three weeks. All of a sudden, one of our students who had been witnessing to her friends and we had celebrating the failures and, the, and their friends dipping, she had six friends show up. And all of a sudden, our youth ministry literally grew over 30% in a matter of two and a half months. And it was just not her. It was a multiple kids. So when I say that, when we're building confidence in young people in the area of music and, uh, you know, and encouraging them, it's okay to make mistakes and grow along the way. We've got to build a culture in our ministries. Uh, you know, we have to build it as a safe place for failure and for mistakes. And I feel like we've done an injustice as adults in the church to our young people that we expect perfection out of them. And I think we've driven them a little bit out of our churches because of that. And we've not created that safe space to grow, make mistakes and to be able to know that, hey, you're not going to be yelled at, rebuked, or anything, but we're going to encourage you through this so that you understand that you have to make a mistake in order to grow. Because you're, like how Melissa said, I love it. You're not growing if you're not making a mistake. So that's just a different story when it comes to developing young people, but I think it overflows in all the different areas of building a, a healthy culture. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. That is so true. And you know what? What that speaks to me about is, again, going back to the tenderness of even our youth, they're at a stage where they have a whole lot of questions about themselves, you know, kind of trying to figure out, am I a kid? Am I an adult? What's going on? And, and they are afraid to make a, a mistake. I, actually, they are, in some ways, some of them are people pleasers. So it's like, if I please you, then I'll get a reward, right? <laughs> you know? So. Yeah, sure, okay. sure, can I say this one thing? I'm, I'm biracial. I am mixed. My mom is German. My dad is Guyanese. I grew up in a West Indian home. Okay. If you made a mistake, you got the belt. You got okay. reprimanded. There was no question about it. You know, I don't, like, I mean, I don't know about anybody else's house growing up here. Like, I mean, 
I'm not trying to sell my parents out here, but this was the reality growing up in a yeah, Westphalian home. I was brought up in a Protestant Irish family. Okay, I moved to Ireland when I was I moved yeah. to Canada when I was nine, so I got the belt a few times. <laughs> you know, but I share this story with our students, like you know, doing math. If I was doing math and got it wrong at home, I got in trouble. That wasn't encouraging to learn math. I I still don't do good in math today. My wife has to help our kids with math, but you know, my parents were doing their best. Please let me say that with what they knew. But sometimes the culture that we even build in our home carries over into how students become fearful in the church and development because they think they're going to get like, I'm half Guyanese. You're going to get the licks if, you know, if you don't measure up. And uh, so I think that's a carryover that we have to be very, very cautious and very sensitive to uh, just with the different dynamics that come into play of how we can encourage kids to grow and learn. That's a good point. Go ahead, Milton. I was just going to like to build on that is such a good point. And, uh, and I was thinking like as, as, as leaders and as parents, we are the representation of God. And so if we come down hard on them, um, then they, you know, eventually, you know, feel that when they make a mistake, they've let God down. Right. And I'll be vulnerable even right now and just say, I feel like I have just worked through this hardcore you know, hardcore the last couple of years of realizing that Jesus loves me, whether I do anything for him or not. Jesus loves me if I flop. Jesus loves me all the time. It really comes back to the heart of things. And so we as leaders need to represent Jesus well when yeah. we are representing, when we are leading young people um, and, you know, what we are expecting from them, how we communicate them verbally and non-verbally. Sometimes our non-verbal um, is, is heard even louder than our verbal, um, whether it's a look or whether it's allowing of mocking of worship that youth even think are bad if they're mocking it, you know, to be able to come in there and just say, you know what? You, you can't judge their heart. You know, their heart is pure. Maybe their heart is even better than our heart. Um, so just in all around, just just communicating the Father's heart of, of what worship really is. Mm -hmm. Melissa, you were sharing earlier about how you uh, got to the uh, young kids to do the group, to, to do the Bible study, to kind of elaborate and do right songs. A great program. I think that's awesome. But I'd like to hear, Jason, you were talking about the worship arts camp. Could you open up, maybe somebody at home is thinking, what, what's that all about? Uh, yeah, our, our Amplified Camp really is about helping young people, not just within the church. We actually open it up because we already run some community programs in our church. We run basketball and dance um, in partnership with Canadian Tire Jumpstart. Uh, so for us, we're trying to really invite kids into the building to grow in the area of that. So our, our Amplified Camp really is broken up into a few different areas. It's... Uh, uh, it's um, uh, singing, it's um, instrumental, it's dance. I think they even had painting and a, and a couple other different areas of uh, arts. Uh, to just encourage and inspire kids to just take what they're passionate about and to be able to grow into that. Right. I love what Melissa said about the Bible study and devotional time they do. Mm -hmm. That's incorporated as well because we want them to understand that it's absolutely critical to have that relationship with God. Uh, you know, in what you do, God's gifted you with that. So use it for his glory. Um, so that's something that we've done over the last number of years and built that. And it's grown every single year. Um, we didn't do it in March this year, obviously. No, uh, I, we didn't do it in the summer as well. Um, we're really trying to, we're really believing that uh, this is going to pass us, uh, this COVID situation, so we can get back into the rhythm of really developing that. And, you know, and, and I understand rhythms are, disrupted at the moment um our you know our core team our youth that are involved are still practicing and being involved they lead on friday nights where we are back in the building uh doing uh, youth on friday nights we spent the first nine weeks over the summer summer doing outside um and uh, just restarting kids ministry and just figuring out how we can get them re-engaged and involved there but so let me just say one thing you know even friday night um I had the worship team over to a bonfire at my house uh, because it's been difficult for them, for, for, for our team. And just want to let them know how proud we were of them of, and, and just spent even in our backyard over a bonfire, not inside of our house uh, because we wanted to, <laughs> and with masks on, just so everyone knows, mm -hmm. just a little bit of time of worship to let them know that worship isn't just something that we do on Fridays. It's just part of who we are when we gather together. And, uh, 
So we've tried to overflow that in mentoring, which Melissa talked about in so many different facets, just to be able to pour in drop by drop, uh, whatever we can. But uh, I know I've sort of veered off the amplified part, but just want to encourage anyone that's listening, you don't have to wait for those specific camps or those times to mentor young people. It's those one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's those uh, worship practices. It's those moments that they even reach out and say, hey, do you have a few minutes just to spend some time and maybe we Zoom and while I'm practicing, you give me some feedback and you know, taking a moment to pray and just bless their life and be involved because it really comes down to relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we've tried to focus on with our students within the ministry uh, that are not just in the area of music, but overall that relationship aspect. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you actually brought up what you're currently involved. Maybe we could talk more about that. Um, but Melissa, what about you? What is, what has your transition been like through this whole up, this uh, way of doing things? Like, what is it like? What are you transitioning into now? Uh, with COVID um, yeah. has actually blown my mind because um, at right away um, there were just so many people at home and all of a sudden we got like three times, four times the amount of teachers to the point where we had one-on-one -on -one teaching almost um, wow. the students. And so we changed it from an evening thing to the middle of the afternoon. Um, uh, the kids, you know, it, it took getting the parents on board. And actually, that was one thing I wanted to touch base with a little bit too, especially the younger, the kids that you're working with. You're almost working more with their parents than you are them. You know, and trying to remind the parents that they need to practice, trying to remind the parents that they need to get on time. And so we had to teach the parents how to make sure that there is a light bulb in front of, you know, the computer, how to set up, you know, the technology beside the piano or whatever we were doing. Um, and so it was the biggest learning curve for the parents. But once the parents um, figured it all out and got on board, um, it, it's been cool. We did take the summer off um, just to give them a break. And so we're starting back up, um, but it actually took off more. Um, and so I think the encouragement in that is that, um, you know, we live in a really great day and age where there's tons of technology. And if there is a will, there is a way you know, and so um, God will work through through it all. Um, and being able to, because kids, especially that age, do love technology, they actually have loved the excuse of getting on technology because it's through Zoom, you know, and then if we can kind of tweak their, you know, um, curiosity of, of looking up, you know, musical stuff online, um, mm -hmm. using GarageBand to record themselves and teach them, you know, how to do that. Actually, my son is taking bass lessons for somebody and he's all of a sudden now wanting to do GarageBand more than he does video games. So that's been a huge plus. That's awesome. I love this. This is so cool. Yeah. And so it's been, it's been great. Well, I want to connect your son with my son because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my totally. son is supposed to be learning bass and he's just going, okay, I want uh, I forgot, Roblox or whatever the other game is, right? So I'm going, that's not musical. No. <laughs> Jason, you were going to say something? No, I'm just, I'm just laughing with you guys. I think that's so funny. My kids are into Roblox as well. <laughs> oh, <is that> right? <laughs> <laughs> Never played it, but they love it. So what do you, what do you see? What do you see is going to, what's your goals um, coming up in the next few months uh, for engaging your youth uh, to continue moving in an upward momentum? Hmm. <laughs> I Sorry. feel like I'm living right, right now. I feel like I'm living week to week. <laughs> um, do you know, I really can't speak on the music side of things uh, per se uh, in our, well, yes, I can. And I can't, but we just had this conversation on uh, Friday. Can, you know, can I be honest with you? I'm just really believing that in this whole midst of this situation that, you know, with this pandemic, that we would see God really bring a revival, a revival to the church and revival to people's hearts. And I, and I said to our youth worship team, this is honestly what I said to them Friday night. I said, guys, I said, I really believe God wants to pour out his spirit. Mm -hmm. And I said, I understand we're not seeing everyone come out at the moment. And I understand we're singing with mask on and, you know, and it's not comfortable the way that we would like. But I need you to understand is that God is still in control. 
he is bigger than this. This has this not caught him off guard. It's caught us off guard because we never thought we'd be doing church like this. But God, but the Holy Spirit still is able to move in among all the limitations that we have. So for me, mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing is instilling in our worship team, which I said to them this past week, and in our ministries that we're involved in, is that the Holy Spirit is still working. And we just need to continue to be hungry. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice. And we just need to continue to give God our all and watch God move in the middle of this. And I can't really say what that's going to look like. All I know is that God is faithful. I know that when we gather, whether it's two of us or three of us, we've not seen everyone come back to church. We've seen the average 30 35% of people, whatever it is, but God is still moving. And, um, you know, and being in a place of community where God is moving among our young people, I guarantee, let me say this. We've seen about, um, when we were running outdoors, we saw 75% of our youth ministry come back, which was interesting because our church at that time had only experienced maybe about 25% of people coming back. So it showed me that young people still love to gather now that we're back in the building, it's a little bit different because we hear everything about the being inside, but still wanting to create an atmosphere for those that are there that we've come in to meet with Jesus. And so I think the goal for us over the next few months is that as we continue to gather, we're here to meet with Jesus and just give Jesus everything that we can and continue to allow that, uh, that development to grow. For example, because of our dynamics and we can't be in our youth room Normally, because our youth ministry is too large for the room, we're now in our main sanctuary, which we have movable chairs, and I can't have drums in there, so our drummer is playing the cajon, and just helping him understand, hey, I know you love to play drums, but you're on cajon, man, give it all you got, God's going to just flow through your life, and uh, so just using whatever we can to encourage them in the, in the, in the kind of limitations we have, that God is still going to move, it'll be different, we come from more of a Pentecostal style of a church, So Pentecostals don't like quietness or acousticness, if I could say that. (laughs) Well, right, right. So, you know, depending on the style of church you go to, but our church, you know, we love full out band, all that. And I love the loudness, but now we're a little quieter and helping them understand that God is still in the quietness of, of what we're doing and will could even be more powerful in this moment. I love it. I, I just when you said that, I was just thinking of uh, the biblical story of uh, I want to say Elijah mm-hmm. um, being you know in the mountain. He was scared because Je- uh, not Jezebel <laughs> wanted to um, uh, was after him to kill him. But here he was hiding in the mountain, and God was saying, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" And then he allowed a big storm or something to go by, or a big w- and God wasn't in the wind and. And he allowed something else and God wasn't in that. But as soon as it was the still small voice, this was the little thing. It was the small thing that God was in. And that's what caused Elijah to come out and, and respond to God and, and, and receive whatever the next ex- instruction was from him. So such a good point that in the midst of this time when people might feel like, you know, COVID is, um, is a way of stopping the churches from moving or stopping God from moving. God's not limited at all. And you're right. We have technology. God's going, boom, this is mine now. And he's using it for his glory. So this is, uh, this is true. And I love what you said, uh, Melissa, about how could they love technology. So let's use it for the advantage. Like let, let's take advantage of it. Let them, let them go on there, but let's direct them to doing things on the, with the technology that engages them in ministry. I love that. I really love that. Um, Great. Yeah. COVID, COVID I, I, I look at COVID almost as just a modern day version of what happened in Bible times when, when the church was, was gathering together and all of a sudden something happened that caused them to scatter, but it was a way of God allowing his word to scatter, so to speak. And I believe this is just another way that God's doing it. I don't know if you feel that same way, but that's how I see it. So, you know, um, but I also should say, you know, um, audience, I know we're just having this conversation. And if you're just joining us right now, um, we've just been engaging in a conversation um, here with Melissa 
McLaren and Jason Prasad, both are pastors at different churches in Ontario. And we're talking about how to engage our youth, how to engage them, not just with music, but just engaging them to actually be a part of a ministry. And, uh, and it's been an awesome conversation so far. We've been learning a lot. And um, if you're watching us here on YouTube or on Facebook, you know, share the experience. Let everyone know what's going on. It's not a private conversation, you know. And, you know, grab your coffee and let's go. <laughs> yeah. I, I do have um, to maybe uh, as we're coming close to the end of our time together, actually, believe it or not. But I, I think that um, there's some people out there that may be need encouragement. But I look back and go, it's those moments that I was involved in worship and uh, whether it was singing or playing an instrument that have uh, and, and, and had these God moments that have helped me today, what, what I call Bethel moments, not mm -hmm. necessarily Bethel Pentecostal moments, those yes. moments that I had as a young person that kept me throughout the years when I struggled with faith, when I struggled with the bad decisions that I made in, you know, as a young person that have kept me safe today. And I really believe that as God is using them and working in them, as they face life and the challenges that come along, these moments, God will help them remember to keep them through the difficult storms mm. that they'll face. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's been moments when, um, you know, a young person has been leading worship. I don't know if this was the question that you were asking. Do we see, do I see myself in the kids? Is that well, no, the, 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 the whole thing about, you see people and you say, man, that's me when I was that age, or I, I can totally relate to what they're going through because I'm that person. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Especially the insecurities and mm -hmm. being able mm -hmm. to look at them in the eyes and go, it is okay. You are, yeah. you know, this isn't about those <laughs> people out there. Just close your eyes. And Jesus is so proud of you because you know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they're shaking in their boots just the way I still do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, I want to thank you both so much for joining us um, on the program. Um, it's been a real blessing. Um, and Cheryl, um, she has uh, been waiting for this uh, too, because we both have a passion for youth and her children are uh, in the age group. And uh, it's kind of neat to have you with us today. And I'm kind of becoming kind of serious. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so Cheryl, jump in and lighten the mood. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I echo your thank, uh, your thanks, Gail, for um, Jason and Melissa. What you shared with us today is just absolutely inspiring. I, I, was, I think it was inspiring. Um, I think if I were a church leader, a youth leader, a worship leader, I would be sitting there going, hmm, I need to figure out how to do all of this too, you know. How to, how to get our youth engaged and how to encourage them. And uh, biggest takeaway, take celebrate the mistakes and let this be a safe environment so that, so that the kids can feel like that even if they do wrong, it's okay. They're learning. It's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. And audience, I want to thank you for joining us as well. Um, I hope that you are encouraged that you're learning a lot from this. And again, even though we're going to be signing off this this it has been recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again and again. Feel free to share the link um, and, and um, encourage. Definitely go out there, encourage youth, encourage your leaders as well, because this is a time of change. COVID has changed a lot of, a lot of things for us, um, but this is a time, time of change and a time of opportunity. It is a time where even for us at Gospel Music Industry Hub, where we can encourage unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. And we want to do that with you and for you. So thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Jason and Melissa. God bless your ministry. And we'll see you all next week. Bye for now.